Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you might be dialing in from. Welcome to another episode of the Team Coaching Zone podcast. My name is Melissa Sayer. I'm joined by my trusted colleague, ally and friend, uh, Dr. Krista Lowe. Krista, do you want to say good morning? No, good morning, everybody. Great to be here. And um, I'm excited because today I get to be a guest on the show and not um, hosting. So all the pressure is on you, Melissa. <laughs> yes. And I, and I have to say, um, given that your name is totally synonymous with the Team Coaching Zone podcast, I'm really feeling that my kitchen's a bit warmer than, than normal. <laughs> and so uh, welcome guests. We're delighted to have this conversation. For me, it's such a multifaceted, interesting conversation because here we have a fabulous group of uh, team coach practitioners from uh, different parts of, of the world, uh, different parts of the United States. And all of you have a shared interest in coaching startups, venture capitalists, uh, working with private equities. Um, but in addition to your individual interest in doing that work, and um, we are, I think our listeners would love to hear about um, some of the stories that you can share with us about doing that work, you also have formed a team yourselves to do some collective work and look at something um, that you know, is, is completely new, which is a team diagnostic specific to uh, the, the startup space. So we have so many different things to explore. Um, but before we kind of get into those stories and, and hearing more about what it is that you're all up to, perhaps we could start um, with you, Jana, to do a, a, an introduction, uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, and then we'll hear from each of your, your colleagues. And, and get going. Good morning and welcome. Sure. Good morning. Thank you, Melissa. So I'm Jana Basili. I am a, an executive coach that's currently based in Evanston, Illinois. I moved here after uh, several decades in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I think we'll be telling more robust stories in a moment about what got us into our work. But um, you know, I had a, a professional sales career in the global or uh, Fortune 100 for 10 years. And then as a hobby pursuit, uh, landed in this area that got me into coaching. And, and over 20 years, that's built to coaching executives, um, also emerging leaders, teams, and then going into organizations and teaching uh, EQ as it applies to the workplace. Wow, fabulous. What, what an amazing hobby. And then to... <laughs> To, to grow into <laughs> uh, something uh, as, as uh, great as this. Well, you're very welcome. Um, delighted to, to have you here. Um, Carolyn, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you are? And Sure, sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carolyn Sklar, and I uh, have been an attorney coach, coached for lawyers for almost 20 years. I come out of a, a marketing and business development background and so turned coach to lawyers, helping them uh, um, think about how they're going to grow their business relationships and, and drive business growth. And during, during that time, during the 20 years, I saw a tremendous need for my own growth and knowledge around organizations and teams. And so um, went back and got a master's because I, I could only take the, take the lawyers so far <laughs> as I knew. And so that's really grown and evolved. And most recently, um, really seeing the need, the tremendous need for team and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's what le has led me to the 16 conditions um, and then to uh, the subgroup of for the startup. And I can explain a little bit more on that. But I have been um, coaching lawyers for quite a number of years who are working with the investors, with the founders, with the with the owners oh, of startups. Yeah. yeah. And I guess uh, coaching teams of lawyers is different in itself. <laughs> and, and maybe maybe you might want to say uh, a little bit about that and the kind of differences in, in the, the mental models that they hold around collaboration and, and teamwork. Fascinating. Great stuff. Yes. Um, Mark, David, Andy, you'll notice that I was gracious and introduced our, our <laughs> wonderful uh, ladies first. So who'd like to go next? Oh, I can jump in. So I'm Andy Powell and I'm based in Cleveland, Ohio. And I've been a 
I've been working with teams um, since the early 80s, actually, going back to self-directed work teams and things like that, always working in the organizational behavior, organizational psychology uh, space as an internal. And uh, about nine years ago, left that world and, and uh, moved out on my own. But before that, I had spent the last 15 years working in a large pharmaceutical company. And uh, in that time, had the opportunity to do a lot of work with biotech startups that were acquired and being integrated in or kind of being left to kind of sit on sit on their own, uh, but with a, a light tether to the mothership. Um, so that's been the work that I've been doing um, with with groups and teams. And then um, probably the other thing I would mention is that, you know, as part of my journey from going internal to, to starting my coaching and consulting business is getting connected with um, the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. So I'm on the faculty there for uh, several of the programs that involve with coaching and also team coaching. And, um, and in that journey is actually through Gestalt is how I learned about the six conditions and team diagnostics and uh, uh, CRISPR and, and folks like that. So uh, it's been a, been a fun ride. It's been a blast. Um, yeah. Lovely to have you here, Andy. Um, David, Mark, well, you said my name first, so yeah, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I'm David Tate. Um, it's a pleasure to be back on the team coaching zone in, in this marvelous company uh, of, of colleagues. So um, I came to uh, team coaching, um, I guess, in a, in a couple of different ways. I start, I, I'm trained as a, a clinical psychologist. I've been doing works with, you know, work with groups um, for a long, long time of all sorts, different kinds. Um, but began um, uh, working with family-owned businesses uh, probably about 20 years ago mm -hmm. and um, working with um, different teams in family business systems, whether they were uh, management teams or uh, family teams. And uh, there's certainly um, a lot of um, interesting dynamics and complexities there, um, as you can imagine. And... Um, but then, you know, started working uh, more broadly with um, with other types of leaders as, and, and teams outside of family businesses as well. Um, so today I have a, a, a firm called Conscious Growth Partners, where that's our focus is working with leaders, teams and um, and, and organizational culture. And um, and then so that's sort of like half of my life. The other half is at Yale, where I teach in the school of primarily in the school of management. And the courses that I teach are. Um, focused on teaming um, in one way or another. We, I teach a course in interpersonal and group dynamics, um, uh, a, a, cor a similar course that Jana had, had been involved with uh, years ago at, at Stanford um, and, and, and was, was working with us at Yale as well. Um, so there's a lot of interesting different connections among this group. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but so I'm, I'm passionate about helping um, the next generation of leaders develop the teaming skills that they need, not just the technical skills, but the capacity to to work better together to mm -hmm. solve kind of the world's most challenging and pressing problems, which aren't going to be solved um, by individuals, That's but will be right. solved by teams. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, one other thing I'm reflecting on as we're talking, David, is that as the economies uh, are facing into difficulties and the just the the sheer impact of family businesses uh, on the economies that are often forgotten or, or, or overlooked um, and the importance of, of doing work in that in that area. Um, well, wonderful to have you back again. Um, always wonderful to talk with you. Um, Mark, and then I will come back to you, Krista, because there may be an assumption that everybody just knows uh, Krista, but of course, every week we have new listeners joining us. So, Mark, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Where are you dialing in from today? Usually it's somewhere exotic and interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's all relative, but uh, I'm, I'm dialing in from home, which for me is Amsterdam. Um, Lovely. Uh, although originally from Australia, called Amsterdam home for about 20 years now. Yeah. Most of which was because I was working uh, as an internal uh, organization development consultant for a large corporate, um, had a almost a 25 year career as an internal consultant um, and then went external 
as it were independent, I should say, a couple of years ago, which I thoroughly love. I think there's something about the diversity of clients, the, the, the learning that comes from working with others that you get when you're um, able to work with so many different clients and so many different projects uh, that, that I relish. And for me, echoing what David said, the, the more I do this work, the more I see that it really is teams and it's multiple teams in organizations is where change really happens. Um, not only happens, but it's also how to make it stick. And so that what, that's what really draws me to the world of um, team coaching, team effectiveness, um, and so forth. And, you know, as you said, Melissa, this is one of those teams. And I guess I'm also yeah. the, the, the reason why this team uh, came together on a journey about four years ago. So we can get into that yeah. a little bit uh, a little bit as well. Yeah, it'd be great to get into some of that storytelling and how this team formed. And I might even be bold and ask, are you applying some of your own uh, expertise into <laughs> being a team? And <laughs> Okay, so uh, Dr. Christopher Lowe, good morning. Appreciate that quick pivot you? off that question, Melissa. Yeah. All right, then. Although I think, I think we, we, we did some good practices, I think, from time to time. When we become aware of, you know, it's always mm -hmm. about zooming out and applying what we know on ourselves. But of course. Uh, I'm Christopher Lowe. I'm an organizational psychologist and co-hosting this show uh, with Melissa. And um, I really, um, like most people, have been in a couple of careers. My first career was mainly in the conflict resolution world for about a decade. And uh, that led me ultimately... Um, I saw the benefit of that, but also the limitations. And I wanted to get a little bit more on the proactive side of helping teams and organizations design and get off to good starts so that they would avoid a lot of you know unhealthy or unnecessary conflict. So that led me to team coaching. I started Team Coaching Zone podcast in 2015. David Tate was one of my early interviews that year. And uh, yeah, the, the rest is history. And <clears throat> so now eight years later, this has been kind of my passion and my my love and um i have to say david and mark are kind of uh, i hold them accountable for getting me into this uh, startup space i worked with david on a, pri a project where we worked with 13 teams in a private equity portfolio and that was really a, a great experience and maybe we story tell a little bit about that and then that led also to working around a due diligence process with a, a health tech startup that that PE firm eventually, you know, plowed a huge amount of capital into and took a controlling ownership stake. And it was out of that work, which Mark helped us on that project that, you know, this idea of starting to look at team effectiveness in the startup space um, mm -hmm. became kind of an interesting topic and, um, you know, led to our collaboration and pulling together an assessment called the Team Diagnostic for Startups, which we'll probably talk about a little bit about a little bit later in the show today. So. That's my uh, story of how I ended up here in this esteemed well, group of, um, you know, rock stars. Yeah. And it certainly is an esteemed group. And what I'm really loving about this conversation is just hearing about how along the journey of maybe making pivots in careers or um, pursuing different interests that you saw something that this work is needed and it needed a different type of coaching or a different way of working with, mm -hmm. with teams, whether that be because of, you know, the dynamics that uh, are created in families or whether it be because of, you know, the way uh, lawyers are typically formed into, into partnerships and, and used to working more in silos and, and, and those kinds of things. So I'm loving how you all have you know, different reasons, different motivations, different experiences um, and different stories to tell. But I think it would be great to start with that first story that kick-started uh, Christer, David and Mark into becoming a team to work on uh, this kind of tangible project together. Um, because to me, that sounds like it's, it's the evolution of what's brought this wider, wider group together. So, David, do you want to start off by telling us a little bit of the background and context uh, of that project that you were all engaged in? Yeah, well, as Christopher mentioned, we had done this work um, with, with a client, with, you know, which is a, a private equity firm. And, um, and in doing that work, really saw the value um, for investors to have a better understanding of what are the drivers of team effectiveness, 
Um, and, you know, and in doing that project with a larger um, group of teams in the same portfolio, it also, by introducing the 16 conditions framework, um, we helped, you know, the leaders and, and executive team members, um, both within teams and across teams, adopt a common language for um, being able to talk about what are the building blocks of team effectiveness. And so, um, so that project really kind of, you know, helped us look at, you know, thinking about, all right, how do we um, kind of scale awareness about team effectiveness um, in, in ways that um, serve both teams, but also people who are investing in teams. And so, um, and so as we have this opportunity to work in a due diligence uh way with with a with a team that was being um, kind of evaluated for being acquired we we utilized again 16 conditions framework and created a process to kind of help um kind of suss out how this team you know was 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 functioning and um and that that we we called the first version of the team diagnostic for startups we called the team diagnostic for investors the tdfi okay. yes i remember um, that yeah yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and so, you know, from there, you know, we also um, uh, realized that there was rather than fo focusing through the lens only of the investor that we really wanted to broaden that and, and think about, um, you know, f startups of, of all kinds, uh, you know, are on a journey uh, to becoming a, a better team. Uh, and so um, we wanted to kind of again, uh, kind of, I think, bring the, the best science available and make it a little bit more specific and usable and applicable for the startup ecosystem. So I think I've said enough. I will, I'd love to pass it to Mark or Krister to sort of fill in yeah. any other yeah. parts of the story that I may have missed or that they want to highlight. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to pick it up because I think, you know, as, as time passes, memory fogs a little bit. But we, we, had, we had two things going on at the same time, you know, David and Crystal were right. They, they did that work with the, the private equity investor. And at the same time, I was having a conversation with a, with a VC who was aware of the 16 conditions framework. And when they were looking at their due diligence, the thing they were finding was there wasn't anything really looking at the effectiveness of the teams that they were about to invest in, knowing that one of the key, I guess, success factors or, or conditions for success is the effectiveness of the leadership team. And so, you know, having known about 16 conditions, having known about Krista, Krista having done the work with David, that's what kind of threw us all together. Um, and then from there, we built out the team diagnostic for investors, which is really robust, but it's a really interesting and difficult ecosystem to be working in when you're trying to engage with investors. And, and we also so hit a lot of brick walls. And I think, Melissa, to your question about did we practice what we preach in a way, this was one of those moments where we kind of stood back and said, what's our purpose here? What are we trying to do? Um, linked with, I guess, almost being a bit of a startup, uh, we were challenged, do we persevere with the team diagnostic for investors, which we could see was not going to get the traction that we would love it to get, or do we pivot? There was actually a, a, another investor coach who um, put laid that challenge down for us. You know, what are you trying to do? Who are you trying to serve? And is this the best way to do it? And as David said, that's where the pivot came in, and we ended up with the uh, the team diagnostic for startups, um, which which we'll talk a bit more about. And through that, the, uh, the, the team grew as we brought on coaches mm -hmm. who are currently working with startups. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are several more uh, coaches involved in, in, in a working group with, with you guys. Um, so it, it is absolutely uh, starting to develop into a, a, a real collective ambition around bringing this 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 work uh, to the market. But I want to go back and unpack some of um, what David and Mark are saying, and maybe Krista, you can help us unpack this. And by all means, mm -hmm. Andy, uh, Jana, and Carolyn uh, jump in. But I want to unpack the idea of for those that aren't familiar with working with startups. Um, 
the mm. idea of investors evaluating and the typical yeah. criteria that they would have been looking at and what you are potentially trying to educate investors around in terms of, uh, well, here's another yeah. lens and another criteria. Could you say a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I actually wanted to add a comment and it kind of gets into this a bit. So there's, you know, assessing a team before an investment and then there's de helping a team develop after an investment. And so the first project that David and I worked on with the 13 teams, I think was a really insightful because one of the things I noticed about uh, private equity backed teams that have this backing is they tend to be a higher functioning, I would say. They're more effective on average than a lot of the team, thousands of teams that we've seen in other kinds of settings. And I think part of it is the investment, there's accountability, there's some oversight, which can be some can be annoying. It can be annoying at times, depending on how much the PE firm is involved. involved but I think yeah. it kind of, as a way, acts as kind of like a coach, a type of team coaching. It's a proxy in a way for team coaching. But I think this PE firm was really special because when they make an investment, and there's a lot of focus on looking at the books and the business opportunity because they want to scale these things up <laughs> and sell them off for profit down the road. Um, and they're looking at the composition. So there's a couple of things they're looking at. But this firm did four things after investment. They looked at strategy, organizational strategy, team composition. They were really big about getting the right people in the right roles. And they're not shy at all. They will push a new CEO in, a CFO, a CTO, whatever the role is it needs. And if there's no, there's no hemming and hawing, they kind of, you know, will do that, which is great because, you know, composition can be, a great strength, but it can also be a major liability. Um, organizational culture, and the fourth was team effectiveness. And that's why they brought us in, because they didn't think they really knew enough about the team effectiveness space. But they knew it was important. So I just want to make that point, because I do think <clears throat> post-investment, all the challenges teams face are very similar. Um, it just may be a little, it's unique and you know dynamic at the same time. So I think that's just the post-investment part. I think on the front end part, Again, when you know firms go in to evaluate taking, you know, investing or taking over a company, there's a lot of focus on the financials and the market opportunity, and you know there is some focus on the composition of the team. But again, I don't think, and you know, when you look at the research on what makes you know startups successful or failures, you know, team issues are one of the top three issues over and over again, and it tends to be more of the afterthought than a primary decision factor. So I think that's the thing. So when we went in to do the due diligence case, you know, we could use an assessment, but we had to couple it with interviews because, um, you know, the team could put their best foot forward because they know they're being evaluated and they could game a survey, but they can't game behavioral based interview questions. And so when we would interview them independently, we could really dig into like, questions that we know as team effectiveness professionals they don't know about and can't game and then we can match up all their responses and, and adjust their survey rating so anyways um but i think what i took an appreciation from all those you know teams we worked with is the power of having accountability and a, a set of external stakeholders that care about you want you to succeed mm -hmm. and are supporting yeah. your success and helping your success you know hopefully accelerate um, so I think um, of, like it's so yeah. healthy, right? So it's yeah. so healthy and proactive. We're saying, well, let's set this up for success and structure ourselves for success here, yeah. as opposed to let's just get it off the ground and then sure we can fix that 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 later. And yeah. and the damage then that that sometimes mm -hmm. does to, you know, people's well being because they're so invested in this thing that they they wanted to get off the ground and now yeah. potentially they're experiencing uh, uh difficulty i i love that i i guess um and any of you can uh jump in on this another thing i heard you say was we needed to take what we knew about team effectiveness so we were drawing from uh a, a shared um appreciation of six team conditions but we needed to put it into to a language yeah. and, and and a way of uh being practical for for mm -hmm. for these teams and these startups and so so forth and i heard david use the word you know what are the building blocks and for those 
listeners out there that may not be as used to working with uh, diagnostics and specifically team effectiveness di diagnostics, can you say a little bit about these building blocks that are most important for these teams to be to be thinking about? Was that for me or was that for, for anybody? Any, anybody can jump in, yeah. Well, let me let, let me pick this one up, and um, you know what we can do is put the link uh, in the chat to the team diagnostic for startups because I think uh, that will give a good framework. So we found there was um, so that'll take you to the uh, the six team conditions site, but when we we looked at the um, the team six team conditions team diagnostic and then tested that in the startups uh, ecosystem and spoke to a number of uh, startups, a number of investors. And we saw that there was uh, some commonality. So things like team purpose, for example, the team still needs to be really clear about what their role is as a founder leadership team. And this is different to the purpose of the business that they're wanting to create or they're asking investors to invest in. Um, and that can change very quickly over time as context changes. They might move from series A to series B investment, um, bringing on new people. So that was one that was the same. Um, Composition, for example, is a little bit different. Um, it's a right size is still the same, but one of the things we found was you get red flags if there's too many friends and family who are on a startup leadership team, um, which you don't get in the in the usual corporate teams that many of us work in. Um, another area of difference that's also really important is coachability. You know, a, a founder leadership team that isn't receptive and open to coaching uh, by others, whether that's investors, key stakeholders, or, or between themselves, you know, the ability to give each other feedback um, was one of the, the key building blocks that we saw was absolutely necessary. Um, rewards is an interesting one. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, one of the key departure points between the team diagnostic survey and the, and the, the one for startups. And it's where we did a lot of research. Um, one might think that it's really important for a founder leadership team to have uh, equally distributed um, equity or rewards. And, and that's where we started. Um, but the more we dove into the research, the more we spoke to the teams, that split is, is not the key driver. And the, the key thing is that the team has had a really good, robust conversation and is committed to whatever the split happens to be and that they're comfortable with that. Um, so one of the things we, we explore is have you actually had that conversation? And those rewards can be financial, they could also be intrinsic. It depends on the nature of the business and, and, and how that uh, company operates. Um, work practices are also uh, important here. You know, I think many of us have, have engaged with serial entrepreneurs. Um, and if they're just bringing the same work practices that they've always used in their businesses, is that really the right thing to do? You know, different business, different contexts might be might need a different way of working. And so that's one of the things we look at. Um, and of course, interdependence. You know, that's key when it comes to teams. Interesting with startups, uh, at least the two that I worked with as part of our pilot and research was there was too much interdependence because that was actually slowing everything down. There was this uh, the sense of they all needed to do everything together. Um, mm -hmm. And we talk about the importance of interdependence. And it was the first time I'd really come across an example of, well, there's actually too much interdependence. So start thinking about what is it that you absolutely have to do together and what is it that you can do apart mm -hmm. and maybe just update each other on. And so hopefully what I hope people are getting a sense of is, there's a lot of overlap with uh, team theory and team research and what you'll find in the team diagnostic survey and the six team conditions framework. But there's, in some cases, it's nuances. And in other cases, there's some really uh, fundamental differences um, that we were able to bring to the surface through, you know, a couple of years of uh, research, exploration and piloting. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely. Carolyn, I'm hearing you um, uh, make sounds of, of agreement and, and I'd love to, to hear <laughs> one of your stories maybe around how um, you start kind of using some of these building blocks to to work with some of 
your clients and some of the work that you're you're doing? Well, it's interesting. I was smiling um, about the comment about interdependence. Um, we we sort of had the I don't know if we take a deep dive, we might find that the same issues were there, but it was interesting to see how they were surprised that they got a lower score on interdependence. And mm-hmm. so we had to distinguish between what, what are you working on together and what are you working on individually? And it was really an individual kind of mindset coming together, um, but they were missing those pieces of things that were unique to the team that they could work on together. So, mm-hmm. so that's what I was smiling on uh, about. But, but um, you know, what's so fascinating is that with startups, they are already in a growth mindset. Um, versus fixed mindset. You can see some teams that have a sprinkling of fixed mindset folk, and then you got to address that when you're working with the team. But but there's a collective growth mindset, and it creates an energy that um, is really a great starting place. Yeah. And depending on the team, I mean, I did talk with one one team to ask them to participate in the pilot, and the team was falling apart. Um, and because of various variables happening, but you know, I just can't help but think how they would have benefited from putting the conditions in place for effective teaming so that they could be in a better place to, to continue to grow their business. But so those are just um, a couple of the, the insights that, that I've seen around um, uh, the, the, the limited work I've been doing with teams, but um, the potential for working with those teams. I love that. So it's like, the growth mindset and putting the conditions thinking in place. And then Mark was talking about, you know, coachability and the importance of uh, coachability of leaders, coachability of teams. Um, I wonder, can any of you comment on uh, this, this whole idea of what it is to put the conditions in place or conditions thinking or designing teams in this way for 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 success so i know we talk about the the building blocks but just to make that really really explicit as a way of working with teams would somebody like to kind of share some insights or a story can i just uh, about, tack on yeah, tack on to yeah, that please you know please what's do. interesting and i think the others would might agree is that we saw that the the six conditions were in relatively good shape for most of these teams. Um, mm-hmm. And when you take a deeper dive, it's the key task processes, you know, is where the work, you know, the opportunity to grow. So um, I don't know if others want to comment on that, but that's an observation mm-hmm. that, I, that I made. And for those that aren't familiar with the key task processes, what, what, what's, what's meant by, what is meant by that? So there might be some of our audience that don't know what we mean by the key task processes. That's right. I mean, it's the it's the work of the team. It's the the way they get things done, the way decisions get made, um, information flow, and those sorts of things. So once you have those building blocks in place, you know how do you go about executing the, the work of the team? Um, and I, I I had a thought on that, but Jan, it looked like you had some yeah. something you were getting yeah, ready to yeah. say on this. Uh, thanks, Andy. Well, I just wanted to chime in on some of the individual building blocks. I had four startup teams in the in the mm-hmm. uh, pilot study, and had some actually very different experiences than what has been mentioned so far, which is to say there's such a broad, you know, well, we toss around the word startup, but startup could be, you know, tiny uh, couple people in their garage, or it could be someone who's, you know, Mm -hmm. landed their series A funding and they're scaling and they're going for series B and um, they could have a very sophisticated leadership team that, um, you know, has maybe a, a few MBAs uh, or very experienced leaders on the team. Um, you you could have a startup team that uh, that is populated largely with people brand new to leadership, and so there's um, many many things I wanted to say. So try to um, keep a stream here. For example, the coachability. I saw that coachability marker being really helpful, whether it was a, you know, say more experienced team or whether it was a newer team. Um, For the, for a more experienced team, uh, one of my studies had a a very success, you know, successful experienced CEO and had been getting great feedback from his investors. So you're talking about that outside source of coaching Mm -hmm. and still wasn't convinced yet that he was doing what needed to happen. And, um, 
you know, the, the role of a CEO, especially a startup CEO, is so stressful. It's actually been um, linked to some of the work on trauma that Bessel van der Kolk has talked about. And the, um, it was only this diagnostic debrief where he saw the feedback in black, or not in black and white, but in like in a visual form and had this structured conversation with the other leadership team members that it sank in for him. Okay, the outside feedback source has been telling me I'm doing well. You're all telling me I'm doing well. Now that I see the, the graphics and some of the quotes and the markers, maybe I should believe it. So it was this really huge source of relief and um, empowerment for him. And then there was a younger leadership team that I worked with where they might have had a, a little bit of interest. Oh, maybe let's do a personality test and, um, and look at that. And oh, we are giving each other one-on-one -on -one feedback. Yeah, we really like feedback. But they hadn't really thought of how do we give feedback to each other as an operating unit? And they were shy to ask for feedback from the outside investors because they wanted to put on the, um, you, you know, put their best fit forward in terms yeah. of not admitting a lot of uh, questions and not, you know, uh, prioritizing. I'm only going to um, reach out to them with this issue or this issue, but they still had yeah. so many questions amongst them that um, they didn't have a source of really a reality check or kind of a structured way to look at it. So mm -hmm. that um, coaching, you know, for me, if we can come in and provide a framework and get them talking and then launch them with new skills of being able to think about things in a data informed way and have more, uh, more honest conversations about things that might have been an elephant in the room, um, that that's yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, to your point, to build on that, it's it, what, what I found was that when we did the, when I did the debrief sessions with the teams that I worked with is it gave them a language and, uh, and, and, and words that they could use to have these things that they were aware of at some level, but were having a hard time articulating. And it, it, so it wasn't that they weren't willing to have the conversation. They just didn't know how. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they didn't know how to maybe put into words something that was kind of bubbling viscerally in the team. And mm -hmm. so I, I found that to be really the case. Um, you know, and just to, in, in my situation, the teams that I worked with were kind of two different buckets. One were teams that were supported by angel investors. So it wasn't you, you didn't have a, a private equity firm that had a, a common mission as much as you had some, you know, wealthy individuals who wanted to sponsor folks, but didn't, were pretty low intervention with the team in, in that situation. And then the other was kind of the opposite, where they were startup teams, but they were startups within an organization. So they didn't have, they, it wasn't, they were already employees of you know, a, a large organization, but had been put off in a separate building and another side of town in very yeah. different kind of space. Um, and so that they could kind of live in a virtual startup world, but but had you know, a different context. And I think that was the, the other piece that stood out to me with uh, using the instrument was that the instrument itself helped them really take a look at their contextual circumstances um, structural mm -hmm. things around them, but in the debrief was where we, actually I saw a lot of the behavioral stuff would come up. So if you're from a coaching perspective, if you're looking at kind of doing a quick diagnostic, just watching how the team processed the feedback um, gave you a lot of information as a coach in terms of how you might work with the team and some of the dynamics within the group. Mm -hmm. And if I can just build on that, I think you've touched on you know a, a key elements of this, which is the debrief process. You know, a tool is just a tool that, in this case, will give you some nice colors. And we have a good solid report that goes with it. The, the dialogue that goes with the debrief, I think, is, is really what sets this apart from some of the other mm -hmm. instruments that are out there. And there were just two stories, I, if I can share. One was with a, um, a team, a leadership team of a business. They were all in their late 20s. Um, and... They filled this in and we went through it all. And, and the CEO said, and I'll quote, shit, this means we're leaders. 
Went, That's well, right. <laughs> yes, it is. And you're a leadership team. And so it was a real light bulb moment. Of, it's not just about product. It's not just about price. It's not just about market. Um, it reminds me customers. of the first time I was left in, uh, in in the room with my son. Shit, this means I'm a mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Proceed. <laughs> and so we had a great conversation about well, what does that actually mean to, to be a leadership team and to be a team of leaders mm -hmm. as you start to grow your business. So that was, it was actually quite a beautiful moment in a way. Mm -hmm. And another one on composition was this was a business that was, and the composition came out red. Mm -hmm. And the reason it was red, this was a father and two sons who were leading the business. And they realized they were going to bring someone new in. And I asked them the question, how are you, what are you going to do to make it a, um, a welcoming place for this, uh, this new person who's going to join your team because they needed a new position? I said, well, we'll just tell them how we operate. And I kind of explained to them, it's like having someone come to your dinner table, but every night, because you're a family and a family is, it's David, you know, a family is a system. And at the moment you've been operating as a family business. So as it was in the debrief in the discussion, we talked about them needing to think about what do we need to do differently ourselves? Um, and maybe even bring in two people at the same time, rather than just one person um to address some of the challenges that come with being a leadership team and so kind of really echoes andy's comments that the the survey is great the report is solid but it is that guided debrief conversation which is where the richness uh comes through i'm also hearing though from uh jana's stories in particular it's not necessarily just the diagnostic and the dialogue there's this skilled coach who can see things that perhaps, um, you know, aren't aren't always observable. So the one I liked about Jana was, you know, around this whole idea of like seeing where people are at and meeting them where they are in terms of their leadership growth and journey or whether they were like, you know, really experienced with and, and kind of more sophisticated teams or whether they were, you know, kind of just feeling their way through. And, and that's a, like an, an expertise and a, a level of experience that you guys have, have built up over the years. I guess you've mentioned the pilot a number of times and there might be a few people out there going, what is this pilot? What, what are they talking about? So do, does one of you want to kind of share with us the whole idea? And this is where we're really getting specifically into uh, your pilot study on the team diagnostic for startups and what you're doing with that pilot and uh, what, what it is that you're you're hoping to, uh, you know, find out, achieve by undertaking this kind of, of research. So who wants to share a bit about it? Sure. I can talk just a little bit about that and others I'm sure can chime in. Um, the idea of the pilot was that when we developed the team diagnostic for startups, um, you know, we, we started with the team diagnostic survey and looked mm. at, um, you know, util like building off of that instrument and adapting it to um, kind of, you know, modifying it so it was a um, more fit for, for startups. And as, as Mark mentioned, we added these dimensions of coachability and rewards, which are um, pertinent for startup teams in a way that, that aren't necessarily true for other kinds of teams. Um, so the idea of the pilot was to, since we had created this new instrument, was to, um, uh, I guess, a couple of things. One is to uh, sort of validate the, the, the survey itself uh, to make mm -hmm. sure that kind of, you know, that we're actually measuring with some kind of reliable reliability and validity kind of these, um, uh, particularly these, these additional dimensions. Um, and secondly, was kind of an opportunity to um, pilot our whole process of, um, you know, like, you know, d d you know, doing the, the assessment and then doing the debriefs and really bringing um, a level of kind of consistency and kind of a, you know, a process um, to how we do that. And, um, and so we ended up recruiting a, um, a, a around 40 teams uh, to participate in the pilot from around the world. Um, yep. uh, and, um, 
And so, you know, we've been, we've had the opportunity to learn a lot from that experience, mm -hmm. um, you know, both, both in terms of, you know, how the survey looks, but also, you know, moreover in terms of how teams really receive it and the value and the benefit um, mm -hmm. both to um, the teams and to, you know, investors in some level and also to the coaches uh, uh, who are involved in, in using the tool. Okay. Um, so you uh, recruited 40 teams from around the globe. Was there a specific criteria as to where they were in their, the, the, the stages of their evolution or? Yeah. So the, the, the and Melissa, maybe you want to put up the, the link to the TDFS itself um, so that people can go in and have a look at that site. Um, the, the thing that we said was uh, we wanted um, um, the startup needed to be at least three people who had worked together for three months because by mm -hmm. three months you've then started to develop some norms and practices. Um, mm -hmm. We found out, what we found was we had some very early stage teams as well and um, probably too early from a diagnostic point of view. But still, they there was still value for them in understanding the framework because as they started to embark on their journey, mm -hmm. being aware of the elements of the framework um, was really important. Through to some that had been around for a year or two, uh, probably about to scale up, um, and so it was quite. There was a diversity of where they were in their the arc of their uh, uh, development, um, yep. industries locations um mm -hmm. it was incredibly diverse i see you've got the diagnostic one there there's the link that's specific to the team diagnostic for startups that uh, could be good to share okay we'll have a look for that just now and um, keep going though mark because it's 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 interesting because what i'm hearing is you're talking uh around teams where you used the framework prescriptively and descriptively. So for some, it was, you know, you were you were doing a diagnostic and helping them see that data. And for others, you were using it as a way of building the team because they were so early on in, in, in their journey. And maybe also if you could say a bit about the, the debriefing and the coaching they receive. And I think you took time to data as well. So it'd be great yeah. uh, just to kind of dive into that whilst I look for that link. Yeah, so the um, so the t the time one and time two was really important. As David said, you know, we wanted to make sure we had a valid instrument, um, and and also hear back from the end users around how it had contributed to their performance over time. Um, and so we had time one, time two, uh, good research practice as well, and we also um, uh, changed some of the wording of the questions. We also changed the report between time one and time two. So it was a real opportunity to get that feedback. Mm -hmm. um, the coaching element, again, it, um, it varied. Um, you know, some teams relished it and wanted more. Others, it was, okay, thank you very much. We're now done. Helped your survey. We've got the results. We've had our coaching. We'll move on. Um, and I know with some of the coaches, they've actually stayed in contact with the teams that they have uh, that they were working on as as part of the pilot. So you know, with any with any uh, diagnostic, that piloting is important. There we go. Now it's up. Uh, that piloting is really important, um, and for us, it was a key element. You know, I also wanted to honour the 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 research that went behind the team diagnostic survey and and the the rigor that. Um, mm sits there and that was that was the foundation for what we developed um, so we had ruth who was instrumental in the design of the um, 16 conditions framework also on our design team because it was really important that if we're going to put something out there and if we're going to put it in the hands of coaches it needs to be an instrument which is robust and that you know we could uh, honestly say has has credibility, reliability, and validity to it, and, I th and I'm pretty feel confident that we can do that. Fabulous, fabulous. Um, so were some of you the coaches in this pilot? So I know that you kind mm -hmm. of commandeered all of these organisations in, and then you brought together a big group of coaches. But it'd be great to mm -hmm. hear a story or two about one mm -hmm. of your experiences of of undertaking this. 
Sure, I could share one, Melissa. Um, and it speaks to the interdependence theme. So one of the uh, teams I worked with was one where it was, it was a very sophisticated uh, CEO in terms of experience level and um, kind of a database of knowledge of how to, how to build and run a company. Um, and most of the leaders were very new to leadership. And in the debrief, just that one hour, that first one hour conversation, we have a we little, have a little um, echo on your sound. Oh, uh, I don't think it's on mine. Uh, you folks can mute. Uh, so let me, thanks. So let me, thanks. Yeah, someone else. There we go. Uh, so um, the, the experience, I do a lot with experiential learning, and there's a whole story around um, T groups and about 85 T groups I've been involved with, which is this bedrock of experiential learning. And um, the many of the members had had this mindset that, well, if, if it's not my department, if it's not my area of expertise, I'm going to let my colleague speak to this question. I'm not going to chime in because I don't know about their area. And they they had this very siloed mentality, and the conversation allowed them to realize oh, we're a leadership team. Um, all of our voices, all of our questions, all of our hunches, all of our thoughts are important because even if I don't know the perfect answer, my thinking about it can lead to a group conversation in which we're more able to uncover in a decision process what's the best, the best route, the best path. And the, by the end, I had people say, oh, I feel much more comfortable um, just speaking up and contributing to the team and uh, feeling, oh, I feel more aligned and um, more energized, more excited, more aware of some of those intangible rewards that, that keep me here. So I don't know if actually, Melissa, this is actually answering your question, but I was very impressed that the, the, the debrief and a, and a 55 minute conversation had people leaving feeling more embodied in their role, more willing and able to contribute, and um, just more energized and, and confident. It is answering my question, but what I'm also taking from it, every time you talk and tell a story about your work, you're so connected to the work and it's just, you know, hooks me in and draws me into to, to what it is you're saying and, and, and I really appreciate it. Um, and it sounds as if you're having these kind of magical moments with these teams where you're kind of really helping them during what can often be a very difficult time. And one of the things that I'm always conscious of with, um, you know, uh, startups and uh, those that have venture capital and, and private equity investment is the journey that these teams go through. And it's often the grieving processes that sometimes need to go on as the company evolves into being something bigger. So, you know, they start off as it's, it's all about the idea and the creativity. And then, of course, as they grow and some of these investor expectations come in, they start having to put processes in place and it feels less like a family and more like uh, something else. And it's kind of, do any of you have experience or want to share a story about, you know, really helping those teams see that, you know, this is a natural process of going from being a, a startup to what they want to be, which is kind of a, a more mature uh, company with, with growth. Um, so I could tell a story um, dovetailing off of Jana. Um, you know, my team, uh, Angel Investment, two years to almost three years in running, doing really well, um, had some numbers they needed to hit to drive business growth. And so when I approached the, the founder, um, he was delighted to participate in this, um, the idea of working on the team. We've never done this before. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so I had some, um, I had meetings with the leader prior to the two sessions, just to cultivate mm -hmm. that relationship, 
no surprises, you know, et cetera. And, and also to find out what his key uh, business drivers were so that we could use the, the hour time that we had efficiently and focus on some of those things um, as well as, you know, how the team aligns with what they're trying to accomplish. And so um, this, the team that I've been working, that I've been working with is they, they are a global team. They are all over the world and their primary communication is via Slack and they okay. rarely get together um, for team meetings. And so it was delightful for everybody to get together for a team meeting. Um, and the leader is the kind of the only leader in the room, uh, not, not, he doesn't mean to be that, but people look to him, you know, as the only leader in the room. And I think the, um, I'm, I'm confident that the, the time together created a, a more collaborative environment. And yes, they realized they're a leadership team and that was an aha moment for, for the team. So, so it was a very positive experience, which led to then um, a, a um, onsite, you know, everybody in the same room a meeting that that he is planning for the team this year so it was really um it was really a positive step forward in taking their eyes off the ops and focusing on the team and how might we do things better so that we can continue to to drive growth and scale and i, I have one as well um there was um th this is a team that as i came in it was very kind of late stage so they were very close to launch uh, okay. And this is an insurance product. And um, it, it was, you could tell it was later stage because the team was like 18 people and it was the whole organization. Um, and they had grown from a starting of three or four. And as people got added on, they became part of the family and it just got bigger and bigger. Um, but the feedback early on was there were, there were lots of questions about interdependence um, there were a core of people who saw the team purpose as kind of the overarching purpose. And then there were others who were very focused on their own silo in terms of the purpose. Um, and so all of that came out in, in the debrief and, and not to go into all the dialogue around it, but part of it was just to help them step back and take a look at their evolution and see what the arc of their growth had been relative to kind of where they were now and what, what really would be the ideal way of organizing themselves for this kind of final stage. You mentioned grieving. Um, and I think that was a piece of this is that in this environment, because it was an internal startup, there's a point at which the product gets launched and then it goes back over to the, the parent organization. And mm -hmm. this group, there might be a couple of people that actually move with it but then yep. they either move on to the next project or they, they leave the organization. They go somewhere else, yeah. yeah. Right, right. So yeah. there was this kind of real dissonance you could sense in the group around, we're excited about reaching launch, but there's also um, you know mm -hmm. an end coming. And the end result, when I came back, we did two rounds of this. I, you know, it was like three months later. Well, the, the core team was four people. Um, and the other people either were somewhere else in the organization or actually that some of the work had been outsourced. And they realized that at the launch point, their focus actually was very narrow on some key decision making and some key actions to get this over and all of the efforts to kind of keep everybody coordinated. That pur purpose had been served um, and there was something else to do. Um, and, and what was interesting is that the... Um, the team leader said it was a direct result of our diet, their decision to do that when they did, it was a direct result of the dialogue we had around, around the, uh, the TDFS. Fabulous. Uh, Christa and I had a, uh, 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 sorry, David, I'll, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Christa and I had a uh, team on ID pal uh, recently. And what was fascinating was they were, they were able to name, oh, well, I was employee number three, I was employee number five. And just in that following Monday of us interviewing them, uh, employee number 45. And one of the things that they were starting to notice was things that they were involved in and always involved in in those early days were now being passed off to 
to other people to, to do. So one example that the CEO gave was that um, he would have always had the, the kind of final chat with every person before they, they were hired. And he no longer uh, does that and in, involved in that now. And he's, you know, trusting that the culture is established enough that the, the right people will be hired into the mix. Um, I don't know if that's resonating with with any of you guys in terms of story, other stories that you want to share about these kind of, you know, evolutions of leadership and evolutions of how to collaborate and, and how you support that kind of work. Um, and then I, I do want to come back to David because I think I kind of cross bumped across you there. No, that's okay. Uh, it actually, actually, you know, I'm just resonating with with these examples and uh, two quick examples to share yeah. uh, along these lines from the pilot. Um, one was a, a, a team that, um, you know, ha has has been had made a lot of strides was was moving forward with scaling starting to scale more quickly. The, but the, the folks they identified in their executive leadership, executive leadership team through the process realized that not everyone on that team was really focused on the enterprise level, that actually mm -hmm. some of the team folks on the team were really more focused on their verticals. And mm -hmm. they and and by time two, they actually changed the, the composition of that top team just to include the people who were really needed to be working interdependently on behalf of the whole enterprise. And that actually really um, tightened up um, their ability to communicate with each other much more efficiently. Um, and, and, and things seem to be in, in a better place as a result. So that was one story. The other story was a, a team that um, was a, a health tech startup um, with, a, with a very strong social kind of purpose mission. Um, they found um, that they you know, scored very highly on a, on a sense of really, uh, they had a really strong, compelling purpose among them. Um, but it was really their first time being a, a team together. They were recently kind of put together um, by the investor, the investor kind of pulled together the different executives and um, they were still finding their feet in terms of being able to work together interdependently. So they came out uh, as, as really needing to focus on interdependence, among other things. Um, but, and, and, they, and they decided um, to really take that up at their next offsite and spent a day or two really dot, drilling down on how we're going to work together interdependently um, you know, what is everyone's roles and responsibilities? Um, how are we, what are the, how are we going to come together? So they really spent time on it. And what was lovely to see was that when we um, did the follow-up three months later, they had absolutely moved the needle on that. And they went from like, you know, red to green, actually, Whoa, um, in, cool, inter right? in, in interdependence. And there were still other areas that they needed to focus on, and but but yeah. but it but it gave them kind of a, a bit of a roadmap as to where should we be for, to be able to make conscious decisions about how they how they focused on their on their team's development. Um, bringing yeah intentionality. And David, were they were they self coaching at this stage? Were they so were they kind of you were helping them identify these different things, and then they were going off and doing the work and. Or was there a mix of things going on? Um, well, they were doing. They were lar largely doing, you know, self coaching. Actually, um, so mm. they 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 had a one of their team members mm. was was sort of functioning as the team coach, who was kind mm. of in charge of sort of like you know HR and sort of people related stuff. Um, she she took on sort of an internal team coach role and helped hold the space for their for their discussions. And um, for them, that was really impactful. And they've told me recently that they still go back to their survey just as a way to sort of kind of gauge and, and look at the different areas and think about um, where they need to be focusing. So it's really what's been nice to hear from them is that this has really had legs in terms mm -hmm. of really framing their own approach to mm -hmm. their team's development um, over a longer mm -hmm. period of time. I really love that because like that's competency building within the team from a mm -hmm. very early and young age exactly. that then gets cultivated and brought into the culture. Um, but that's a, a, a really brilliant. Uh, I think that's the big opportunity, it's like, Melissa. It's a big opportunity yeah, isn't to it? build this into the culture before you scale, because yeah. then it's going to yeah. be too late because you're not going to be able to do it uh, well enough. Can yeah. I jump in on Serge's great Please question? Can... 
Yep. It's always great to have Serge. He's always uh, here uh, oftentimes and he asks great questions. But yeah, you know, I think as a team coach who came out of more traditional team coaching in corporations and foundations and universities and, you know, international organizations, um, I've learned a lot just, I think I've learned a lot just by learning about the unique challenges of startups. And I think the books by Eric Rice, The Lean Startup and The Startup Way are great books um, because whether you work with startups or not, I think as team coaches, and this, this message is really for the team coaches out there, there's a lot about great stuff and how startups function that you can, you can pull principles and apply mm -hmm. to any kind of team. And so I think you can learn a lot by learning more about startups. And I think that's, um, that's been very valuable for me, I think, in this space. But the startup way, Eric Rice's second book, is more about how do you bring startup culture and startups inside large organizations. So startups are not just, you know, a couple of, you know, people in a garage somewhere. It applies to all kinds of things. <laughs> Even projects can be startups in a way, right? So I think there's something we all can learn from this. I'll just make one plug um, for the TDFS on our website. We have three audiences. So founder yep. teams, founders and teams can go right on there and buy the assessment. It includes a 45 minute debrief to go over mm -hmm. the results. So we've made that like low barrier to entry. It's really fast. The teams just can go on immediately and do it. The second is if there's investors, the team diagnostic for startups isn't really great for due diligence, but it can be combined with interviews and some other things for doing due diligence, but you couldn't just use the survey standalone. And then the third is for coaches. So um, we have, we are making this available for coaches, but they do need to be trained uh, in the six conditions framework. So I'll, I'll just mention that to you, but I'll just say, you know, I'm not a specialist in startups, but you know, the work in this project and with the private equity, I found really valuable and it's helped me just take a lot of ideas to my other team coaching engagements. So that's kind of my summary comment. I know we're, we're burning daylight here, so maybe we'll get a we are, final few are. things. And I see Jana, you have a couple of books as well. I'll one. let you away with that plug, Krister Wink. Okay. Yes, go on. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to share a friend of mine, uh, Bob Tinker, co-authored a series of books called Survival to Thrival. And it talks about how to scale a startup. Uh, I think he's the one who coined the phrase go to market fit. And um, also really talks about that CEO journey. Melissa, you were talking about grieving um, and that, that the CEO as a company scales. That role has to change so frequently. And there's mm -hmm. such a process of pivoting, pivoting, and letting go, and letting go, and letting go. And I found reading those books uh, very helpful. Mm. Thank you. I'll just also pop that into our chat as well. Sorry, also just an understanding as a coach, the pace and the stressors and what, what it's the life is like inside a startup. This is it. I'm working with a founder team at the moment, and they're just about to launch their game in the next couple of weeks. And um, it's a gaming company. And you just like what they go through and their ability to kind of keep going through. And one of the things that I've kind of been working with them around is just take a pause, take a beat. What do you want to acknowledge in terms of what you've achieved up to up to this point? And just in giving them the space to make those acknowledgements has been really, really powerful because it kind of, you know, energizes them to, 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 to go again and we'll get through this next hurdle. Um, love that. Um, any final comments, folks? So I've put some resources into our, um, into our chat there for our audience, survival to thrival and um, the, the lean startup. There is a question around any recommendations for uh, family owned businesses. David, is there anything that you would recommend there? Oh, I think we have it here. The Galliard Institute, is that your recommend? I think that was Andy. Oh, that was Andy. Okay, brilliant, Andy. Thanks for popping that in. The one um, thing I'd add, Melissa, is look at it, it, which fascinated me was do the reverse, just do the search on why startups fail. And there's a ton of literature there, um, which was one of the triggers for this work. As, as, as someone said, I think at the beginning, you know, the number th the number three reason, the number two reason, depending on the research, is team. Um, so just doing 
just doing that search will give you a plethora of content around the how important dynamics and how important team is to startup success. Mm -hmm. I guess one final uh, curiosity I have is, as a team, have you thought about ways in which you might need to, you know, almost educate investors around this kind of way of, of, of thinking? Is that something that you're exploring? Is there anything you'd like to say about that? Um, yes. So it was more, so I'll start with an experience and maybe Krista can add to it. What we found was that a lot of um, investors are making decisions based are, are making decisions about team based on intuition. Um, the experience, how they how they experience the team during their due diligence process, um, yep. and then from that, we know what a good team is. Therefore, we can see if this is a good team. And I think what this does is it is it shifts it from being subjective to objective, and it actually then allows the investor to then post-investment, here are areas where I think I can support the team, be a better team. And so there was this real, it was also one of the reasons why we shifted from pre to post-investment um, because so many investors have this sense of, I know a good team when I see one. Mm -hmm. And so that's, yeah. uh, I think, one of the, the challenges we faced. Krista, something yeah. you want to add? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, I think um, now that we've kind of brought this assessment live, our focus is going to be more going out to market and doing, you know, blogging and webinars and, you know, holding sessions. So um, on the TDFS site, we have three case studies that kind of profile the work, different kinds of size um, startups and, and scale ups. And so, yeah, I think this is just about for the team coaching professionals, this is an area where we can niche and make more noise. I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space. There's incubators, tons of PE firms and VC firms. So I think this is a wide open blue ocean area. It's not like a crowded space at all, team effectiveness in the startup space. So my closing comment would be just to encourage people to get in this space and even just start reading and um, playing around. I think it's really dynamic. And you know what David said at the outset, it's, you know, the challenges of the world are going to be solved through innovative people and yep. small groups of people coming together with bright ideas can change the world. And uh, I think that's the promise of what startups can, mm -hmm. um, can bring. Carolyn? Yeah, I'll, you, I'll just uh, tack on to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, just casting vision. This is a tremendous space to impact not only teams, but team leaders. And, you know, folks are creating these novel, useful ideas that are helping society and human community. Mm -hmm. And so to have the joy and privilege of coming alongside a team and helping them become more effective as a team and enjoy collaborating and working together on their innovative idea, um, it's just, there's just a tremendous need for this and, and also an opportunity. So those would be my final words. There absolutely is. What I'm feeling really energized about is it just feels like such a healthy approach to evolving organizations and culture and leadership. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of something that came together as, as, as being a dream, uh, a little bit later in its evolution, feeling like, oh, I don't want to be part of this anymore, that it's like en enabling people's dreams to, to stay alive and be empowered and, and, and flourish. So I really, really love it. Um, what I would say for final comments is that um, we're going to do some analysis. So myself and um, a couple of colleagues are going to uh, support with the analysis of your data and your research. And once we have that on, maybe we could do uh, a, a follow-on conversation just to share some of the insights coming out of, of, of the research. And um, just again, how this is evolving for you, because we didn't get too much into you yourselves being uh, a, a team that is come together to do this work. And I think that's a whole other story in itself. So um, what I would say colleagues is time really shoots by when you're having interesting conversations and we've been a victim of that. We are kind of a quarter hour over our, our, our scheduled time. But you can see from our comments that um, folks have really enjoyed the, the, the session, love the stories. 
let's keep this dialogue going because it's it's really important work. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, Melissa. Mark, Thanks, I think you had a final comment to make uh, to the coaches. Yeah, and the, I just I just wanted there. to yeah. Um, so we've got three of the coaches who are part of the pilot on this call. I really want to acknowledge and thank all of the coaches who are part of the pilot. Yes. You know, we couldn't have done it without them and the teams that participated in the pilot. So you know, there's a bigger cast that have been involved. So a, a huge uh, thank you to all those folks. Well, you can see the comments coming in. Amazing session. Uh, great use of a morning. Um, and, and people are really energized about, about your insights and stories. And I'm sure you'll uh, receive some follow-up. Um, Okay, colleagues, go well. I didn't do too badly with my word salad, given that I've been flying through the night <laughs> to be here with you folks this morning. But it's been a joy to spend some time with you. And I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye, all. Take care. Bye-bye. Awesome. Great session.